Okay, so this this is an issue, so. Okay, because you cannot run the water <laughs> right? So. My name is Carol Hull, and uh, I moved to Squim in um, 2007. So we have been here almost 12 years now. We love the place, it's beautiful. My husband worked for a couple of years in education, then uh, retired with me. And uh, we were just enjoying the area. When we moved here, um, I knew we had a septic system and did not pay too much attention to the water. I, I believe I remember that the realtor told us that it was a private water system and that's about all I knew. I didn't pay any attention to the water. Uh, I turned the faucet on, the water came on. Our water system evidently got sold and, and that's how we heard about it. We just got a letter saying, oh, I'm the new owner. And so that was a little bit of a shock and, and some of us were asking questions about that. And then about a year, uh, our water system came up for sale and someone found it on Craigslist. And that was a major shock. And to find it on Craigslist, something as important as your water, like what rights do we have to water? And like who owns this water? And do we have a right? We have this expectation that when you buy land or you have land, you also have a right to water. But in Washington, the property right to land and the property right to water are separate property rights. So a water right is a right to use water. It's, it's a use right. It's not like you own those specific molecules. Because for most of us, like I don't really want to own the water molecules that leave my toilet. I'm happy for those to go away and I get to use new water molecules that come in. So it's a use right, it's the right to the flow of water for a certain amount of water. Our challenge is we have low flow in the late summer and that's when agriculture wants to use more. People often want to use more because we're doing more outside gardening and then fish are coming up the rivers to spawn. So it is high demand and low supply. And so that critical time in the late summer is um, a, a major issue here in Western Washington. Yes, come on in. Yeah, I agree take that exact shot. I've seen that comparison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is just right up in great. You know, in 1948, a ranger came up here, skied on a set of those wooden skis, got up here, you know, found that tree that had the sign on it, and goes to the same exact spot and takes those measurements. So we've been doing it the same exact way, same exact instrumentation, you know, every, every month, every winter since 1948, same way. So it's, so it's a neat long-term record. And this is the same device that's been used, you know, that was used in 1948. It's just aluminum tubes. And um, so you, you, you go out to, to each station along a snow course, you plunge this into the snow, and then you're, once you've done that, then you're able to you know, get your measurement of your depth, and then you're gonna pull, you know, you're gonna pull this up, and then you, you use a scale, and the scale's gonna give you the weight of the snow. So, so uh, we're up here at Deer Park, and, and this is one of um, four sites in the Olympic Mountains that we, we measure uh, snowpack. For the last 60 years, we've been looking at snowpack trends here in the Olympic Mountains. And, and the snowpack, um, like behind us here, uh, we're looking at the Dungeness watershed. And so the snow that's on these peaks behind us, uh, this melts and really, really is the, of key importance to downstream flow right through the Dungeness Valley. You know, the hydrologic year is um, from October 1st until September 30th, and that's because it's like a bank account. You're, you know, you're, you're building up your supply all winter with your rains and your snow. We've seen a shift in less snow over time. We're getting warmer temperatures, more rain in the winter, and less snow in the winter. If our storage is dependent on the natural system, then it's just the glaciers and the snowpack and the mountains that, that, is, that we can rely on. 
and between you know periodic drought and then the, the gradual warming of the planet, those reservoirs up in the mountains um, are diminished and the glaciers um, do not have the mass that they used to. We've lost about 40 to 50 percent of our, our snowpack, our average snowpack, over the last 60 years. We're not in a, a, an ice age, we are in the opposite right now. So making up for that um, is going to be a challenge for our whole area between population growth, wildfires, and maintenance of the habitat and biodiversity of the ecosystem. You know, throughout most of the 20th century, we assumed that there was water available. So we said, oh, you, you want to use water from this river? Go ahead, you get your, get, your, get your water use right, and you can withdraw that amount of water from the river. Squim is known well for its farming. We have a wonderful little microclimate here in our, our little blue hole in our little sun belt. And as long as we can continue our access to water, then that's a great combination because we can apply water for irrigation when we need it and we have the great climate. We never stop to say, wait a second, let's add up how much water is in the river during the low flow periods when, you know, that's really critical. And then how much water have we told people they can take out of the river and does it actually sum up? State regulatory agencies like Department of Ecology started to do that, they found that most watersheds, most rivers were over allocated, meaning the water rights were greater than the amount of water that was available. Squim gets on average about 17 inches of rainfall a year, so if you, you want to be profitable in agriculture, you pretty much have to irrigate. Uh, and so they started building irrigation ditches in 1895 to take water out of the Dungeness River to irrigate, and, and then the, the landscape quickly evolved uh, and the entire uh, um, valley became irrigated. You can see the network of ditches that just go in all directions, all delivering Dungeness River water to, to the plains, to the prairie, which uh, formerly did not have any surface water present, hardly at all. In the 50s, it was one of the, the most productive dairy farming areas in the nation, in fact, because of the mild climate, uh, low rainfall, but then the irrigation. But then, of course, you're taking all that water out of the river. That led to uh, impacts on, on salmon habitat. Those ditches, of course, when they were first built, were leaking a ton of water. So every summer, this prairie that was originally very dry, supporting cactus and oak trees, has been replenished with this artificial recharge coming from the Dungeness River. It's not normally there in the summer. It's a very dry place in the summer, right? So we're, we're farming, or, or we're milking about 400 cows right now, um, and we farm about between six and 700 acres, and the majority of that is used for producing forage and grain for the dairy herd. In, in the 1960s, we've got, we've got all these farmers who had been uh, working extremely hard to, to scratch out a living, and then the area gets discovered as a great place to retire, and as these farmers get older and their kids growing up on dairy farms don't want a, that kind of life, and, and uh, lo and behold, their land is worth a lot of money, and so uh, the valley starts getting chopped up and, and, and turns into uh, rural residential um, and a lot less farming going on. Our ability um, to maintain uh, long term is super dependent on that land base. Uh, we just, you know, we can purchase all the things we grow here, but being how we live so far out in the boonies, the, the cost of having everything trucked in here at the volume we need, would definitely be the end of our dairy operation. We know we need to save water. We need to focus on keeping as much raw water in the main stem of the Dungeness River, keep the fish habitat healthy, keep them migrating. We've spent the last, how many years? 25 years at least, aggressively doing piping projects in areas where we know, boy, this is just a really gravelly two mile stretch 
you know, we have to dump in one or two CFS of water here, and we're only getting one out over there. Nobody's irrigating. It's just, you know, it's recharging the aquifer, but that's not our main goal of what we're doing with that irrigation water. We've made great progress in getting those really leaky reaches taken care of. What are we going to do next, right? We're making progress. We need to keep moving here, but what's our next good tool? We need to find a storage opportunity. We're in this situation where, you know, we need to start thinking about things like the off-channel reservoir in Dungeness, where we store that water to be able to use it in the late summer. Historically, folks have said, hey, let's put a dam in the river, right? And you can back up that water when it's flowing, and then you just let a certain amount spill. But obviously, every dam has a huge amount of complications that go along with it and, and end up creating more uh, negative issues with your fish habitat than you did when you maybe had low flows for a couple months. So that same theory though, if we can store that water but pull it out of the river so we're not putting any dams in, we're not creating any uh, disturbance in that natural flow, we're pulling it off channel and we're making a reservoir. Part of our ability to have confidence that we're you know, not gonna get kicked out of the river or lose that right at some point um, is to make sure that we're moving the ball forward and doing everything we can um, to, keep, to keep as much water in the river as possible. Well, one thing while you're talking about the water system here, and you know, it starts in the mountains, flows out through the lowlands on the peninsula, we can't forget about what happens in the nearshore environment. When that freshwater body meets the saltwater environment, that habitat is fundamentally important for wild salmon and for many other animals. The job here to do the work we do with treaty resource protection and restoration has gotten harder and harder and harder. Uh, on a number of fronts, we're partially responsible for fisheries management, so as salmon runs decline, and then trying to figure out like, okay, well, why are we having such poor return and low abundance? And that stems to a lot of the habitat issues. I think the main thing has changed is the, um, the issues surrounding that water and the necessity for us to aggressively manage that better, more efficiently. The community at large, the tribal community, um, you, you know, they've been a, a wonderful partner moving forward. So Jamestown's Glenham Tribe has a really long history of collaboration and cooperation, and some tribes choose litigation at times. Jamestown has really uh, very much wanted to cooperate and collaborate fish, which is what the tribe is focused on, but the tribe's also focused on community well-being, which includes growing food, it includes living here. The Dungeness River Management Team, which is co-led by the county and the tribe, um, is, you know, sort of held up across the nation as an exemplary way of collaborating and coming to solutions by just sitting at the table and talking about it and thinking about just what does the information tell us? What does the science say? People who work in the rivers and restore rivers like to do is look at the amount of what's called large woody debris. Like, are there big log jams? If you find a big log jam, chances are you'll find fish. They love log jams. And large woody debris is one of the essential components of a healthy river ecosystem because it creates microhabitats where fish can live at different stages in their life cycle. A channel that's like the Los Angeles River, where it's just this concrete, there's no fish habitat there because all it is is one kind of habitat. It's kind of like we don't live on freeways. You know, the main stem of the river is just like a freeway. Like, you don't want to live on the freeway. You travel through it and use it, but you want to live on the off habitats. You want to live on the side channels and the little cul de sac areas and, you know, the little neighborhoods that are created by large wave debris. Well, where we're standing right now is a portion of a levee that was built in the mid-60s by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's a little too close to the river, so when the river started to flood, all the water went to the west because here was this hard point right here. It had no place to move around. 
In self-defense, the folks on the other side put up a levee because they were being flooded. So the levee on each side constricted the river. So a river that had been able to move across its floodplain and store water and provide habitat for fish and wildlife suddenly was in this little chute. And so you can imagine if you don't have any room in a, in a canal or a ditch or a fire hose, you just, all the water is constrained. And then once you let it move around a bit and or when it's got a lot of water and it can overflow, the energy absorbed is really makes a huge difference as to whether or not you've got that scouring effect. There were a series of um, bad effects. Chinook salmon spawn in this reach, but the water moves too fast in the winter and the reds, the fish nests, get scoured out and the gravel grinds into the eggs. The Dungeness River Management team had a technical subcommittee, we called that the River Restoration Work Group. And after the listings of multiple salmon, none of our populations are absolutely thriving. Um, with that, this technical group went through and tried to figure out, well, what do we need to do to make things better? Our goal here is to take this section of levee, about a mile of it, the levee's like two and three quarters mile long, take, take it, move it back to the edge of its floodplain, and give the river room to move again so that we still have flood protection for the community, we have some habitat for fish, we give the river back its, its nature, you know, the way it wants to move, and we even improve water quality, right, because it will have a place to drop some of the sediment that right now shoots out into Dungeness Bay. In the last several years, we've been um, really on the implementation side. We've been working really hard to um, recover lost floodplain and restore that so that it's in really functioning spots. James Chenskalm Tribe is part of the Dungeness River Audubon Center. The River Center's sole mission is education and engagement. We talk about water, we talk about fish, we talk about estuaries, shoreline processes, um, well, native plants, um, septics are a part of that because maintaining septics is a big part of um, our water, you know, where does our water go in the water cycle. Pretty much everybody is absolutely behind water, making sure we have abundant, clean water, that that strikes to our very being. I think we all understand it's a necessity for all life, including our own. And so when we think about water and what's, what's helpful to know, it's just interesting to ask ourselves, where does my water come from? After I take a shower, where does my water go to? Um, how do I know if it's abundant? How do I know if it's clean? What I'm hoping this film does is stimulate, you know, questions. What is the future of our water here? Are we going to have a continual supply of water? Why is Dungeons River so important or is it important? When you're in charge of your own water system or your own well, you, you need to know considerably more. What we do does affect our immediate environment. How we, how we treat it, it does have an effect.